Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited because I have my friend Orly Steinberg here with me today. And Orly is a Keller Williams agent who has been in the business for 38 years, running a mega team, serving hundreds of families every year in the Ringwood, New Jersey area and beyond. She's also an accomplished author. She has a coaching practice and I know a devoted mom and grandma to many people in her family. And I'm just so excited that you made time to talk to us today. Welcome to Monday Morning Mojo. Oh, it's my pleasure. So happy to be here. So Orly, tell everyone a little bit more. I just gave him some of the bullet points. Being in this business for as long as you have, there's got to be a lot about you that keeps you connected to the work. So what do you want everyone to know about you? First of all, I always say real estate is addictive. <laughs> But you, done well, there are so many life lessons to learn from being a realtor, both in being a voyeur into other people's lives for a period of time when they're going through life transitions, to growing a business and learning business skills, to being able to offer your life experiences to your clients. So there's so much richness that you get to learn and grow from as a human being. And it always comes down to, for me anyway, who do I want to be? So in, in growing up in this business, literally growing up in it with the learnings that take place between books and conferences and learning from our clients, you just get to enrich your own life and then take that and give it to others, whether they be other realtors, other clients, or just people in your universe. I love that because it is a people business and we're here to serve others and help them solve problems and create goals. And as I mentioned, you wrote a book, Mindset Reset for Real Estate Success by Orly Steinberg, which you can purchase on Amazon and other stores, I'm sure. In the book, you talked about your definition of success. And I want you to share that with people here today. And I think that's a big part of what drives you. So my definition of success is getting to a point in your life where you have the freedom to be who you want to be authentically the freedom to do what you want to do, to serve others, but also serve yourself and be able to live literally a life by design, which we hear about all the time, but I truly live my life by design. In fact, this past year, I went on a really bucket list family vacation for two weeks. The first week was to Italy with my husband, which was like a honeymoon. And the second week we met our kids in Venice and went on a cruise around Croatia with our Sounds like a dream, right? That is amazing. It was amazing. But, but it was so amazing that when I came back, and we had about five closings while I was away, and I didn't have to do anything. And when I came back, I realized my paradigm shift was I'm living my life and working in between. As opposed to, for decades, working and living my life in between. That's powerful. And I think a lot of people who are listening probably are sitting up a little bit straighter to, to grasp that. So how do you really distinguish between those two concepts and how do you get there? Huge, because when you start in any business, um, especially a business like ours, you're in a grind. Mm -hmm. You're striving. Every day is climbing that mountain uphill and doing everything that we need to do and dealing with all the challenges and transitions and changes and clients. And it's very stressful. In this business, every hour brings with it something else. Mm -hmm. Just got to come list me call. A deal is falling apart. You go through roller coaster emotions on a daily and weekly and yearly basis. But when you achieve leverage and you achieve true success, your business runs on automatic pilot. Things are gelling. You allow yourself to be detached from the outcome because you know that if a deal falls apart, you'll sell them another house. And I always say it doesn't matter when it happens. I need to eat today. I need to eat tomorrow. And I need to eat next year. So when you become that detached from the outcome, you're always doing what's right for your client. But your business starts to flow in a more manageable, consistent manner where you could now shift from that work mode that you're constantly in. And in real estate, I know a lot of realtors are up at night, worried about the next listing presentation, keeping a deal together. I used to call it taking clients to bed with me, 
where you're waking up at three o'clock in the morning yeah. and you're thinking about them and you're dreaming yeah. about them and you wake up with that angst. So I finally threw my clients out of bed with me. <laughs> so it's all about me and, and me getting my rest and being with my husband. And you start to have that confidence where you're no longer striving, but now you're thriving. Now your business is gelling. Now the pieces are in place. And no matter the outcome, I built a life where financially I'm secure, the pipeline is flowing, and I can relax and now live my life and work the business in between. That was the shift. But it takes years to accomplish that. It's not yeah, and that's, I was, I was going to say that. So let, let's take a look at where you are today. So how many people are on your team? So I have three buyer specialists and one and a half admins. So I've always kept a very lean, mean machine that is very profitable, over 70% profitability, which in this business is good. Yeah, 70%. And, wow. And, I, and as I tell my clients on the listing appointment, my team is designed where every person on my team does what they do better than I can do it. And that's by design. So you're getting six professionals that are doing what they need to do. And I'm just the captain leading it and here to guide you. How many units are you all closing now, averagely in a year? We do about 100 a year. Our peak a few years ago was 150 units, but we're scaling back a little bit because we're readjusting to the market and the team. Yeah. So o over the years, you've learned the power of leverage. You've learned how to build systems and models, but it didn't start that way when you started in the business 38 years ago and oh. you were a single agent or a solo agent. What was that like? So as I write in my book, which is written in a very uh, workbook format where you mm -hmm. ask yourself questions at the end of every chapter, but it's also autobiographical. So I take you on the journey from when I first started in 1986 with an 18 month old and pregnant with number two. Wow. That teaches you time management because if I was going to pay for a babysitter to get into the office for six hours, real estate was now costing me money as opposed to making me money. Sure. So it's that initial investment where you're not hanging out with people having lunch. I was there to listen to the top agents, learn from them and make every hour count productively to build a business. Not a part-time job, but a business. That is so powerful right there, Orly. I've been coaching real estate agents now for altogether 14 years. And it's always surprised me how few agents take the opportunity to come in and just immerse themselves in the environment and listen and learn and ask questions. And so you were not afraid to do that right from the beginning. And I think that made a big difference in your trajectory probably for that first year or two. Would you agree? Absolutely. I've always been very good about being self-aware of my strengths, but more importantly, my weaknesses. And when I first got into the business, I didn't know what a realtor was. I didn't even know my town because I used to commute to Manhattan. So I didn't even know the other side of town. So I figured if I don't know, I need to learn from those that do. And I don't know what to say to clients. I don't know anything. So let me listen to the top agents and listen to their scripts and listen to their tonality and listen to their wisdom as they're talking to clients because then I would just emulate that. And then I became an, an education junkie. And God knows this business, I think, is one of those businesses that has the most educational opportunities, especially in a company like uh, Keller Williams. But there's nothing that you can't learn from somebody that has already done it. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. So if you yes. look at where you are now, just right now in your business and where you want to go to the next level, there's tons of teachings out there that can take you there. A hundred percent. And we do have a lot of people who follow the podcast who might not be in real estate. And listen, this applies to any industry, even though I agree that I think we do have a lot of great resources and some advantages to being at Keller Williams as well, because we do have a lot of education. But the bottom line is you have to invest your time to sharpen the tools and to learn from other people in your industry or even just learning from people in business in general. Who have I was just going to say, right? there are so many books and podcasts available today that if you want to grow yourself, there is so much out there in any industry that you can imagine. And it's not only about learning, it's about surrounding yourself with people who are learning based who are successful, who are positive. I always say I have an invisible shield around me that just repels negative people. Oh, I love it. 
<laughs> if you want to complain, I always say, tell somebody who cares because I yeah. don't. But if you're solution oriented and we want to mastermind around a challenge, I'm right there with you and, and excited to be there with you. So it sounds like you're very intentional about protecting your mindset, protecting your environment, right? Because it all is going to have a huge effect on your productivity. 100%. And it starts with grounding myself every single morning, which I write about in the book. Because yes, those are my questions I wanted you to talk about. So again, Orly's book is Mindset Reset for Real Estate Success. Truly, guys, if you take real estate out of it, it's going to help you in any business. And you believe that if you win the morning, you will win the day. So let's unpack that a little bit for everyone so that you can help them understand, number one, why it's important to have a good morning routine and then how they can create their own. Before we go there, I want to go back to what I write in the book about the five pillars. When you're okay. going on an appointment, when you're talking to a client, it will be different depending on what's going on in your life right now. And the five pillars to me are health. So if you're hurting, if you don't feel well, and when you have a cold and you feel like you're in that cloud and you're really shut down, you're not at your best. So sure. health is huge. Wealth, how financially healthy are you? You're going into the appointment interviewing them as well as they're interviewing you because you have enough resources that you're not desperate and you don't have commission breath. You don't have that desperate look in your eyes like, I really need the business. So it's health and wealth. It's personal growth. Who are you as a human being? When I'm coaching clients or I'm talking to my clients that are buying and selling, I'm bringing my life experience into them. I'm almost like a life coach for them, depending mm -hmm. on what's going on in their life. Sure. It's about relationships. If you just had a huge blowout fight with your significant other or a family member or a friend, or you're going through a divorce, that's weighing on you when you're talking to your clients. And health, wealth, personal growth, and finances. So when all of those things are gelling, and obviously life doesn't always gel every day like that, but if you have an intentionality every single morning about these five pillars, you're more apt to be aware of keeping them intact as much as you can. You can't avoid getting a cold or being sick, but you can worry about keeping yourself as healthy as possible and worry about your relationships so your life is gelling and then your business is going to be gelling as well. You don't have that huge distraction and disruptor in your life that is taking you away from what you're trying to accomplish. It starts every morning. So I start the morning off early. I get on my treadmill. I'm listening to a positive self-growth podcast whether it be Mel Robbins, whether it be real estate relation, something that's grounded. Monday morning mojo. Monday morning mojo, exactly. <laughs> I, which I recently put onto my podcast list. And awesome. Yesterday. So yes, you want to start the morning off with something positive. Please don't start the morning with looking at your phone and scrolling through Facebook. Or the news. <laughs> or the news. I do not watch the news. I glance at the news. It's not, it doesn't serve my purpose. Yes. And then after that, I have my gratitude journal. So it's not just three gratitudes of what I'm grateful for, but the word because I put after that. So if I'm grateful for my husband's love and support because it makes me feel safe. Nice. Because it grounds me, because I get to come home to him every night, regardless of what's going on in my life during the day. So it's adding a little bit of intentionality. And then I go to my affirmations. And then I have my tribe of uh, four other women that I email every morning with our wins from the day before and the wins that we want to win today because we recognize that we all are overachievers and we all do this and we focus on the negative. We focus on what didn't I accomplish today? Who didn't I call? What didn't I do? So changing it around, and I got that from John Acoff from the book, The Gap and the Gain. Again, you learn and grow where let me focus on my wins. What did I accomplish today? Even if you're pushing your business 1%, yes. 1% a day, but you're moving forward, that's a win. Yeah, because it's about progress, not perfection. And listen, this has been a challenging year for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, and it's important that you really recognize those little milestones along the way or the things that just made yesterday great and build on it today. Exactly. And celebrate them. Even in the smallest ways, it's about celebrating yourself in some way every single day for the fact that you're 
doing what you want in your life and you're moving forward. And one of the tools that I use as well is to find joy. One of my mantras in the morning is I am in choice and I am in joy. Mm -hmm. I am in choice for what I want to do. If I don't want to go to work, I don't have to at this point. But there are consequences mm -hmm. to not going to work. So I can choose not to. I can choose to BS myself into thinking that I'm busy but not really productive. But the consequences fall on me at the end of the day. So I'm in choice, but I'm also in joy. And I look at the things that bring me joy, both in what I love to do in the business, by talking to clients and guiding them. I love that. And then something that brings me joy at the end of the day to look forward to. So regardless of what went on during the day, no matter how bad it was, I have pottery on Monday nights. I pick up my granddaughter on Tuesday afternoons. So it's something to look forward to that just brings you that joy that no matter what, life is good. And that is truly living a life by design. Yep. Yeah. So I know you said, and you talk about it in the book, it wasn't always this way in the beginning, and no business starts off at a high level, and there's a lot of sacrifice along the way. If you look back, and I know that there's nearly four decades of experience to look back on, but is there a moment where you feel like it just all started to shift for you a little bit? What was a turning point in your business where things start to flow at a different level for you? I think it was like four or five years in to my business where I had a full-time assistant to take all of that paperwork and the things that I'm not good at mm. and don't want to do off my plate. I was into branding myself as only Orly in my community, and it started to gel where people started to recognize me and call me, and it just started to flow. And my bus business became more consistent because as most realtors have a roller coaster business, and my first goal was to have one transaction a month, then two transactions a month in a consistent way where I wasn't going through that roller coaster. When you reach that consistency, yes, you always have that panic button at the end of the year of, great, I've accomplished this, but now I have to start all over again because that's just the nature of the beast. But then you start to trust. You start to trust that you've done the systems You've done the process, you've done the work, and you just have to trust that the business will come because you're doing all the things that have brought you business. There, there was a lot of really good nuggets packed in that. I was taking some notes. So you talked about leverage, you talked about branding, you talked about consistency, the ability to scale your business, knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at, which is why you create the leverage and trust. So I think anyone listening has to ask themselves, am I working on those things? Am I implementing any of that? And I think leverage is one of those things that when you find the right people who can come into your organization and help you do the things that you're not necessarily great at or that you just don't like to do and free you up to do the things that are in your strength zone, that's where you can really see how you can expand your business help more people, certainly make more money, but bring in a lot of significance to your business because you're helping other people achieve their career goals too. So what does it mean for you to be a leader helping other people within your organization? You called it a slim and mighty team, but you still have, I think you said five other people that are helping you accomplish your goals, but you're helping them accomplish their goals. So what does that mean for you? It's investing in others. And when you're growing a team, you're not looking to be best friends. That's not the goal because you've got the teams that are too friendly, but not productive. Then you've got the teams that call themselves a team, but it's really just a group of people who happen to be working together, but not necessarily together as a team. But I've got two team members here. One has been with me for 23 years as my senior mm -hmm. buyer specialist. And my part-time assistant has been with me for 31 years. It's working cohesively where things are gelling and working on automatic pilot because everybody knows what they need to do because I've empowered them to do that. One of my strengths is that I'm not a perfectionist. I don't care if it's done perfectly. I just want it done because mm -hmm. there's 10 things to do. I would rather just get it out there. In fact, my team knows that I'm not allowed to proof anything. I'm not allowed to proof the postcards. I'm not allowed to proof the newsletter because I will skim and auto-correct in my mind of the way it needs to look. But my philosophy is if a postcard does go out with a typo or a, or a misspelling or whatever, and I get phone calls from 
the public, hey, this went out. I'm thrilled. They got it. They read it. They're not judging me because there was a typo, but my team is very good at catching those because it matters to them. So I hire for my weaknesses. They're the perfectionists, but don't get bogged down in that. But I also empower them to override me when it comes to that. They have mm -hmm. to prove. They have the power to challenge me when I want to do something because I learned it at a conference or a seminar I went to and they go, Orly, that's not our image. That's not what's going to serve you. And, and I listen because I trust them. Well, that's the key right there. That is the foundation of any relationship trust. Yes. And, you know, there's a few drivers of trust, right? One of them is authenticity and you have to connect in such a way that builds that trust. But once it's there, that frees you, that allows you to, you know, put your energy where it, it's needed most. Right. And it's being flexible with them. I grew my team with moms that were very involved in the PTO um. and it was brilliant on my part, but not intentional. It just happened that way because those women have serving hearts. Yes. They like to help people. So they have that servant's heart and they also had husbands that were making enough money so in the beginning, it gave me that feeling that I could hire them part-time, but grow them to full-time without feeling that I was responsible for their income, because that mm. was a big deal. If I had hired a single mom that really needed this, but I couldn't pay her if I had a bad year, that would make me very insecure sure. and nervous. So I started off with working moms, and the philosophy was family first. So if one of the kids was sick or something was happening... They were free to leave. So I want to go back to the book and I wanted to ask what your inspiration was for writing the book. I think it's clear that you are someone who likes to give back and you're someone who likes to help people, but I'm sure there was a little bit more to it than that. And what made you decide to write about mindset for realtors specifically? There were a couple of titles that I had before mindset, but first going back to why I and in coaching realtors. I realized that so many realtors were working so hard for so little. Mm. They're working till 11, 12 o'clock at night and selling 10 homes a year. And my joke was, if you're going to sell 10 homes a year, do it all in January and take, it, take the rest of the year off. But obviously, they didn't have that consistency. And they didn't have boundaries. And having servants hard, they sometimes act more like social workers mm -hmm. than business people where they're painting other people's houses and cleaning it for them. And I was like, whoa. So This I, is real stuff, guys. I've heard these stories many times. And I just said, you know what? I'm giving this advice to my coaching clients, but I think the industry needs to hear about boundaries. I don't answer the phone after 6 o'clock at night. I'm with my family. I'm done. I will glance at my phone. I will see who it is. I will look at the text messages. And yes, if they really need me, I answer it. But my clients thank me. And appreciate the fact that I answered the phone. And I've never had that conversation with them. They just innately know that if it's important, I will answer it. But if not, nine to five is when we do business. Yeah. Where, and I, I, I tell my clients, my coaching clients, you pick up the phone at 11 o'clock at night for a client. You just gave them permission to do that to you all the time. Oh, 100%. We show people how to treat us, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So why did you pick up the phone? Why? Because you needed to feel needed. Because you think a deal is going to fall apart. What are you going to do with the deal that's falling apart at 11 o'clock at night, except you're going to be up all night sleeping and worrying about it, not mm -hmm. sleeping, and your client is not going to be sleeping. So at least one of us should be sleeping, and that's going to be me. <laughs> and I'll take care of you in the morning. That's really great advice, because I think that a lot of agents find themselves in that trap, right, in that loop of thinking, and you just come at it from a more abundant way of thinking. It's not just an abundant way of, but you're empowering yourself and you're making uh -huh. yourself actually more professional to your client. Sure. And more important. So when you have those life boundaries, again, getting back to the five pillars, if your life is gelling, your business is going to gel even more. Yeah. So did you look at this book as a gift to realtors? I did. I kind of look, look at it as a gift. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't about making money from writing the book. One of the titles I was going to call it was I Choose Happy. Mm. I Choose Happy. I Choose to Get to the Other Side. Whenever there's a, a challenge in my life, my first go-to is how do I get over it, through it, around it to get to the other side of happy? The other title was going to be I Don't Give a Shit because I had to. 
<laughs> component good. in me, but I didn't think that would fly. So in, in brainstorming with my tribe, we came up with Mindset Reset because it's about how you think about yourself first, mm-hmm. how you think about the world and life and how you see those people around you. And when you have a positive mindset, and granted, not every minute of every day, but I also discuss tools to bring you back there, your life and your business will gel so much better. And you're in such a better place more often than not. Yeah, I love that it is written like a workbook. You ask great questions. You really inspire thought and reflection. And because really, if you don't do the work, you don't really see the change because you can read a great book or listen to it. And then are you applying any of the lessons that you learned in the book? And I think this, the way you've written this gives everyone the opportunity to do that. When you have awareness, you could either live your life proactively or reactively. Right. A lot of people live their life reactively. Mm -hmm. Something happens and now I have a knee jerk reaction to deal with it or proactively where you see something coming towards you, deal with it before it gets there. Challenge yourself. Do you think you have another book in you? People are telling me I have another book in me, but I'm not sure where it's going yet. It's, okay. I'm, I'm looking for what the need is. Oh, okay. What, what do you think realtors need most right now? That's really a good question, actually. I think they need a way to keep life in perspective. Tell us more about that. So you have to look at life, at least I do, in the scheme of life. Is what I'm doing right now going to affect the rest of my life? And the answer usually is no. And I think a lot of us are tied to ego. I know I was for years, ego and identity, where my entire identity was wrapped in only Orly. And one day I woke up several years ago and said, oh my God, one day I will not be doing real estate and I may not be working at all. And who will I be? If I'm not only Orly, who am I? And that was a scary thought because I had been so immersed and obsessed with this success and being this person that all of a sudden I had to slowly detach from her, and I call her like my alter ego, and be who I am and see what my value is as a human being, just standalone human being. And one of the lessons I learned recently about two years ago when I first started taking pottery half an hour from where I live in Warwick and nobody knows me. So I'm not only Orly. Interesting. And it was a wonderful freeing uh, experience on so many levels. A, nobody knows who I am. B, I cannot be with my phone because my hands are dirty from pottery. C, I have a child's mind. I don't know what I'm doing. I have to really be guided. I have to be totally immersed in this experience. And I went into it detached from the outcome and allowing myself to suck and not produce and not be perfect and just let it go and see what comes out of it. And that was one of the best things I've ever done for myself because people started to get to know me as who I am as a human being. Then they started looking at me on social media, realizing my videos, and all of a sudden it was like, whoa, who are you? Oh my God, you're this other person. All right, sure. So now they're discovering who I am, but through my art, through my pottery, I'm exploring my creative side. And I'm going to actually be in a show December 8th where I'll be showing and selling oh, pottery. Awesome. Not that I'm going to be making money, a lot of money from this, but it's giving me validity that somebody wants to buy what I created. That's great. I love that. I think that's another whole topic for another episode is just tapping into more of your creativity. And I love how you said you approached it with a child's mind. I actually went to a local art show here um, in Kingston, New York, by our office, and they had about 20 artists on display, and the one woman that I got to meet, I complimented her on two pieces in the show, and and so I said, how long have you been doing this? She said, "Um, a year, and I was shocked because it was really beautiful, and she says, I'm a lawyer. She says, but I needed an outlet, and after hearing people's problems all day and you know, just working at such a, a, a high level and, and a fast pace, I needed something. And that's what she decided to do similar to you. And I, I just thought that was quite inspiring, actually. So it it really that. is. And on that note, what I was trying to say also is this industry was built on your only worth as much as your production. Mm. You're in an office, the top agents getting the accolades, they're getting the awards. 
It's all about your numbers, which is important because that's a measuring stick to where you want to go. But I think the industry is starting to evolve into the whole human being where that does not define you. And that's yeah. the biggest thing. I, it doesn't define you. I hope you. so. Amen to that because I've been through that myself. And some people don't quite understand it. And listen, I try to help people understand how to be more self-assured and how to define their self-worth more internally than externally. But it's not always easy. And especially when you are in an environment that's very results-driven, very sales-driven, it's a challenge because you can leave at the end of the day and depending on how the day went by your own definition, you feel good or bad about yourself. And then that can turn into how you define your self-worth and your self-image. So it is very true. And I think we do need to find ways to balance that more, especially for women in business as well, because that comes with a whole other suitcase full of stuff. <laughs> Especially in a business where I could be doing 150 units sitting next to Jean Shine from Texas who does 600. Mm -hmm. So no matter how great you think you are in your small pond, there's somebody out there doing more than you. And I think with self-awareness, we need to just say, okay, but I did the best with, with what was good for me. And that doesn't define my value. It has to be what is good for you. And, I, and you talk about that in your book too. So I feel it's like a handbook. For someone to not just survive in this business, but truly thrive and for them to really examine their thoughts, but examine their habits, examine their beliefs, and then put some things into action. So thank you again for writing the book. And that is Mindset Reset by Orly Steinberg. But before I let you go today, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, maybe some rapid fire questions. Sure. So, Orly, who do you admire most and why? Oh, so many people. One of my biggest mentors was Howard Brinton, who was the founder and CEO of Star Power, which is still a lie, starpower.com, where I really cut my teeth in this market, and a lot of amazing realtors like Nikki Ubaldini and Linda McKissick. So I was very lucky to be surrounded by people who not only did real estate on a high level, but had a soulful heart. Mm -hmm. of sharing and giving. And that was his talent to bring together people that were not only successful, but willing to share and help others in this industry to thrive and succeed as well. And yeah, he really changed so many of our lives. And some of my dearest friends are because of Star Power and the people I met there. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. How do you wind down at the end of the day? Because it, it's sometimes a challenge to not bring it all home with you, right? And you did talk a little bit about setting boundaries, especially with answering calls. But how do you end your day? I'm very lucky at this point that I've developed the habit and the discipline that when I walk out the office, unless there's something I really need to take care of, I'm out of here. I know that everything can wait till tomorrow, including a client that calls me up and says, I want to list my house. Years back, I would have been like right there on their doorstep five minutes later, where today I'll just take the information. I'll say, I'm already done for the day, but I'll call you tomorrow. We'll set up a time. So I've learned to like balance that where I look forward to having dinner with friends. Again, I have something fun to look forward to. When I go on vacation, as soon as that plane starts to take off, I take off with it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't bring it with you. I don't bring it with me. I've learned to leave it at the office. Be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. So interesting because I, I have it written down. You just set it up so beautifully. My next question was, how do you keep it real? Because, you know, you've worked hard to build this business at, and you are working at a high level and you're an accomplished author. You also are coaching other agents. So how do you keep it all real? You went on this beautiful vacation. I, I think I'm just... So grateful every day for my blessings and my life, and I try not to take it for granted. One of my mentors and people I look up to happens to be my mom, who is a brilliant woman, and we're so close, and I call her every day, and she lives in town. She's 92, still has all her faculties, but recently she had a fall, and I feel like I took for granted that as much as we're connected and I see her, I don't see her enough. Those kind of things keep you grounded. You look around you, you look at the relationships that your clients have who are 
unfortunately not close and are getting divorced or don't talk to their family. And, and I just take that home and say, my God, I'm so blessed to have that. And I will not take it for granted. So you look around you, what everybody else has, and you just bless and, and are grateful for what you have and just want more of that. So I think that's, that's what keeps me real. That's awesome. What's your wish for anyone listening to this today? I wish for you to be proactive, be aware of who you are and what you want out of life, and then work towards it. Don't just live life like so many people do, just like sheep, where you're just going with the flow and not really making anything meaningful for you because it's so possible on any level to have a better life and a life full of enrichment and happiness and balance. And you're in control. You can do what you want and you can have what you want. Amen to that. I love it. Orly Steinberg, thank you for joining me today. Everybody get a copy of her book. Tell them again the name of your book and where they can find it. Amazon. Just put in either Orly Steinberg or Mindset Reset for Real Estate Success. It's either on Kindle or the hard copy, but the hard copy, I leave you lines to write in. So I yes. recommend that. Uh, yeah, it's a workbook, copy. right? It's a workbook. Yeah, it's That's wonderful. Good. You're taking a time out to work on yourself on so many levels. That's it. I talked about that here many times on Mojo. It's understanding that the greatest project you could ever work on is you and that you're worth the time to do it. Grab a copy of the book, everybody. All right, Orly, thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you thank soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Same here. Thank you so much. Thank you.